Are you tempted to rage at the injustice of your spouse's betrayal? Or are you tempted to turn a blind eye no matter how much their sin hurts you? Hi, I'm Kim Pullen, founder of Hope for Spouses, and welcome to this episode of Lunchtime Live. For those of you who are new to our ministry, I started Hope for Spouses after my four-year separation due to my husband's adultery. While we were separated, I wrestled to get out of God's way so God could work on my husband and I could focus on my own healing using the scriptures and a safe circle of others. Now, we were reconciled in 2015, and since then we've developed a deeply spiritual and emotionally intimate relationship. And really, we give the credit and honor to God because we put him at the center of our relationship. Now, one of the most difficult challenges for a betrayed spouse is knowing how to treat or respond to our spouse's sexual betrayal after it's brought into the light. Sure, it makes some difference if they're repentant, but probably not as much as we think. Often we rage at their sin because we have been hurt so badly and we rightly feel like we deserve some form of justice for the pain they've caused us. Or we minimize their sin, questioning our right to challenge them because we're sinners too and God says we have to be merciful if we want God to be merciful to us. Ultimately, we think we must either side wholly with justice or wholly with mercy. But justice and mercy are two sides of the same coin. Or, as the iconic image of Lady Justice shows us, two sides of the same moral scale. And since God perfectly balances those two sides, um, there's no better example of which we can turn to to see this lived out in everyday life than to God's exact human representation, Jesus. Now we're going to look at two encounters that Jesus had, one with a person who was repentant and the other one with a person who was unrepentant. The first is in John 8 when Jesus met the woman caught in adultery. I encourage you to stop the video or podcast and read John 8, 1 through 11 on your own. It's just really important. Now, while Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, the religious leaders brought a woman to him with the goal of trapping him in his words. According to Leviticus 20, 10 through 12, when the couple was caught in the act of adultery, both partners should have been stoned. Now, as a side note, I think it's really interesting that the leaders only brought the woman to Jesus for stoning. Anyway, up to that point in his ministry, Jesus had repeatedly demonstrated his willingness to associate with people that the leaders considered unredeemable, like prostitutes, tax collectors, the sick, the lame, and foreigners. They probably suspected that Jesus would violate the law to forgive this heinous adulteress and get her off the hook. If he did, the leaders could have Jesus condemned and arrested as a lawbreaker. What they were not expecting was for Jesus to challenge them to look at their own sinfulness. Quite simply, Jesus put up a mirror for the leaders. When they took a sober look at themselves, they dropped their stones and walked away. At the same time, Jesus did not minimize the biblical standard of righteousness. On the contrary, after all her accusers left, Jesus commands her to repent and change her life. Jesus, more than anyone, understood and still understands the cost of sin. He had to pay for it. Yours, mine, and everyone's. If there was anyone in the crowd who had the right to condemn her, it was Jesus. He was the only sinless person standing there. Yet because he was the exact representation of God, you can see Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 and Colossians 2, 9, he demonstrated to everyone that justice and mercy can be held in equal measure without diminishing or weakening the other. Now, the adulterous woman was an example of a person who was repentant. Now, let's look at Mark 10, 17 to 22 as someone who was unrepentant. Again, please stop the recording and read this passage on your own. A wealthy, religious young man literally runs up to Jesus. Now, this was impressive in and of itself since most wealthy people in any day and age expect others to run to them and not the other way around. And the young man's question, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life, seems so spiritual. 
He even claims to have kept all the commandments Jesus mentioned, commandments five through nine of the Big Ten. Now, compared to the ragtag group of followers that Jesus had at the time, this guy seemed like a dream follower. However, Mark's account of this encounter says that Jesus saw through the facade and then lovingly told the man he hadn't obeyed commandments one and two to not make any idols or have any gods that would get in the way of our loyalty and devotion to the God. And unwilling to surrender his idol of wealth, the young man walked away unrepentant. Now, notice that Jesus doesn't freak out and run after the guy trying to come to some kind of a compromise. He doesn't lower the standard of God's righteousness because he was afraid of losing his relationship with this man. No, he lets this seemingly sincere religious man walk away and entrusted him to his father in heaven. Now, again, the perfect balance of justice and mercy. So what about justice and mercy with our unfaithful spouse? Yes, we can know if they are repentant by comparing their lives to scriptures like 2 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11, Acts 26, 20, and 1 John 3, 18. If you're not sure if your spouse is repentant, see the links below to some of my other videos on this topic. Now, yes, the state of their repentance does inform and affect our responses. If they are unrepentant, we must set healthy boundaries and create a safe sanctuary where we can heal. If they are repentant, we'll probably still need to set some boundaries, but they may not have to be as restrictive. But whether they are repentant or unrepentant, it doesn't change God's standard of righteousness and our obligation to be obedient to it. Justice and mercy must remain in balance. We do not minimize our spouse's sin or pretend there are no consequences for it. On the contrary, Ephesians 5.11 says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. God's word says that we are to call sin out and we do it because just like God, we want our spouse to repent and turn to God so they can find healing. See Acts 3, 19. We are their sisters in Christ first before we are their wives. And as such, we understand that our spouse's relationship with God is infinitely more important than their relationship with us, their wives. This leads us to the idea of how we need to deliberately order our relationships. Now, the New Testament has dozens of scriptures about the way we are to treat each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Romans 12.10 says we are to love and be devoted to one another. Colossians 3.16 commands us to admonish one another. Ephesians 4.32 tells us to be kind and forgive one another. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11, the Apostle Paul implores us to encourage one another. James 5.16 says to confess our sins to one another. And Colossians 3.9 says to be truthful with each other. All of these commands are applicable to the marriage relationship because they were supposed to be obeyed in all our relationships with other followers of Jesus, regardless of our marital status. So for those of you who were disciples of Jesus before you got married, in other words, you were a brother and sister in Christ, that spiritual brother-sister relationship you have with your spouse doesn't change just because you get married. In other words, your husband-wife relationship doesn't take precedent over your brother-sister relationship. If anything, it should enhance it. What's more, our relationship as brother and sister in the body of Christ is of a higher priority and therefore has a higher loyalty to God than our relationship to each other as husband and wife. Why? Because our relationship as brother and sister in Christ is eternal. And, is, and yet our marriage is temporary. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty 30, that we won't be married in heaven. Second, we are members of God's family. First, before we are members of our physical family. See Galatians 3, 26 uh, to 28 and Ephesians 2, 19 to 20. Now, this may sound radical, 
But Jesus himself, when confronted with who he would put first, stated, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. You can see Mark 3, 31 to 35. In addition, Jesus didn't die for the institution of marriage. According to Ephesians 5, 25, he died for the church of which we, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 24, are members male and female individuals. He died for people individually and collectively. Therefore, how we balance justice and mercy in our marital relationships is informed first by how we balance justice and mercy in the church with each other. Even if our spouse isn't a believer, or if we started following Jesus after we got married, Luke 14, 23 to 30 says that part of the cost that we should have counted prior to our baptism was understanding and implementing the godly order of relationships in our life. Our loyalty to God and Jesus takes precedent over our loyalty to a spouse or anyone else, whether they are a Christian or not. When you choose to follow Jesus, and when you chose to follow him, he didn't just become your savior, he became your Lord with no other competition for his loyalty in your heart or in your life. If we are placing our loyalty or our commitment to our marriage or our spouse over our loyalty or commitment to God and his word, we have made our marriage or our spouse our God, little g, in place of our God, big G. Only when we have the divine order firmly set in our heart Can we begin to imitate Jesus in our practice of balancing justice and mercy in our marriage? This is what God calls us to, even if our spouse doesn't repent. So practically speaking, what does this look like? How do we do this? First, we need to use God's word and put it at the center of our thinking and our life. Second, we need a biblical strategy for navigating our recovery. And third, we need others to walk alongside us to guide us on that path to healing. Now, if learning how to balance justice and mercy in your marriage with God's word as your standard resonates as truth in your spirit, and you are humble enough to recognize that you can't do this on your own, I want to encourage you to schedule a free breakthrough call with me. Go to hopeforspouses.com slash call. Again, that's hopeforspouses.com slash call. We'll get on the phone for about 45 minutes. You'll have a chance to be heard, see how the scriptures apply to your situation, and get direction to start healing. As it says in Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20, I have set before you life and death. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. That's it for this episode of the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. I'm Kim Pullen. I'll see you next time. Take care.